Hey there, welcome to another episode of Savor Food and Body. I'm your host, Amanda Bullitt, and today I want to dive into another one of the intuitive eating principles. And as you remember, last week we talked about making peace with food. And I want to talk today about a principle that can sometimes get in the way when you're trying to work on that making peace with food part. And that is the kind of foundational principle of intuitive eating called reject the diet mentality. And I've, I also like to think about it as reclaiming your health from diet culture. So we're going to talk a little bit about what does that mean. We're also going to do a little bit of a history lesson uh, when it comes to talking about BMI in, in terms of assessing health and a whole bunch more. So let's dive in. If you've been on diets before, you probably are um, part of the, the percentage of people that know that diets don't work long term. And in fact, 98% of dieting attempts fail. And I want to be really clear here in that it's not you failing, it's not you not having enough willpower or anything like that. The diets are actually designed to fail so that you keep going back to the dieting industry and buy the next brightest, shiniest, uh, for sure it's going to work this time program. So um, knowing that 98% of the time that diets fail, imagine if you were taking a drug for heart disease or cancer and the doctor that was prescribing it to you said, well this is going to work 2% of the time. Would you take that drug? Would you go under uh, the surgical knife in the, with a the 2% chance that whatever the surgery is would, would help you instead of harming you? Most of us would say, no, of course not. Like, those are really, really crummy odds. But millions and millions of people every year help support the diet industry, which is these days about a $70 million industry because we're willing to take the chance on losing a few pounds and being part of that 2% success rate. So my hope and challenge for you is don't be a part of the minority, be a part of the majority, which means um, reclaiming your health from, from those ideas that you need to lose weight in order to regain your health. And we'll get into a little bit more on that um, in upcoming episodes. So. Let's take a look a little bit more about why, why diets fail. And again, it's not you failing, it's not your lack of willpower, it's actually your physiology that's keeping you alive and keeping you safe. Your body doesn't know the difference between having a famine, um, and like a natural disaster type famine, or a war type famine, and you going on a diet. Your physiology just doesn't know the difference. It's just main job is to keep your surviving. So it'll do that through seven, several different ways. One, which you may be familiar with, is of slowing your metabolism. So if there's not enough energy coming in, there's no sense in burning it off. So it tamps down your metabolism. Then, when there is food available, your, uh, your hormone system will signal to your brain to not send the hormone that tells you you're full. So that, that hormone is called leptin. And when you're, you're in a famine state or your body thinks like, I don't know when another famine's coming and I've got this food right here in front of me, I better get it while I can. It's gonna say, don't turn on that message, that leptin message to tell this person to stop eating because we better get it in all right now um, because we don't know when it's gonna go away again. And at the same time, the body, again, is preparing for survival, so that increased food that you take in, while not feeling full as you're doing it, it's more, gonna, more likely to be stored as fat because your fat can act as a reserve for when that famine comes back around again. So, not only do we see your metabolism decrease, but then we also see the hormonal response that lets you doesn't let you know that you're full, so you keep eating, and then the food that you're taking in is more likely to get stored as fat, which I'm guessing is what you were probably trying to avoid in the beginning by starting the diet in the first place. 
So one of the things that we know from the research is one of the best ways to gain weight is to go on a diet. And that's because of these mechanisms that I just described. So a lot of times people will say, well, what about my health? My, my, my doctor told me, well-meaning doctor, said I need to lose X number of pounds um, or I'm going to move from pre-diabetes into diabetes or I have a family, of, of, a family history of heart disease and I'm destined to have a heart attack if I don't, uh, I don't get my BMI under control. So, funny thing about the BMI scale, uh, first of all, it was never meant to assess health, and we'll talk about that in a second. But second of all, we know from research that in 2016, a UCLA study was done, and of the 50, 54 million Americans that were diagnosed at the time as either overweight or obese, and I'll explain why I do that in quotes in a second. Of those 54 million Americans that were classified as such, they really, they didn't have any metabolic markers saying that they were unhealthy in, in the participants in this study. So, meaning they didn't have high cholesterol, they didn't have high blood pressure, they didn't have blood, high um, blood glucose or blood sugar. They just fell into the range on this BMI chart saying that they were overweight or obese. So what's the deal with that BMI chart anyway? So many, some of you may know my first uh, degree, uh, my undergraduate degree and my first career was in history. So I love looking at history and stories behind food and I have just found it so fascinating to see like, how did we even get to this place as a culture? of fearing fat, fearing gaining weight, and if you're also interested in that history, I highly recommend Christy Harrison's book, Anti-Diet. She does a really great job um, kind of breaking down all of the history of how we even got to this place as a culture, um, having this rampant diet culture. So it was from Christy's book that I dug into this history a little bit more, and the BMI was actually created by a Belgian astronomer in, 18, in the 1830s. So in his job, it was more of a, an exercise in statistical um, grouping of a population. So he wanted to see if he could uh, make a, a statistical reference to how people could be categorized in a population based on uh, their body size. So it's important to know that the population he was working with was white Europeans of middle to upper class. So he wasn't taking into any accounts of cultural differences, ethnic differences, uh, in terms of how that those um, uh, ethnicities show up differently in our bodies for a variety of reasons. So he was looking at a very specific type of population and in order to kind of categorize that. So it was already working with a pretty narrow um, uh, description of a person and then calculated this, this scale. And it was called something different in the, the beginning um, and then went on to be renamed, rebranded as the body mass index. So it was until the early 20th century that the body mass index started to be paired with um, paired with assessing health, and it really wasn't until say the 1920s that scales even showed up in doctors' offices. In fact, doctors were more annoyed that people were coming in and asking about weight loss protocols when, in their professional opinion, the more weight someone had on their body the more likely they were to survive some of the trials and tribulations that were going on in the country at that time. So especially for women, we, were, we need to be of a certain size in order to reproduce and um, carry on the population, which was always the goal um, way back in the 1800s and, and earlier. So as the kind of turn of the century was happening and the scale had been invented, then the life insurance and health insurance companies also got on board. And the 
side. Hmm. Well, it seems that people are, that are in a larger body, maybe they're going to cost us more money. So they started to use that scale as a way to supposedly assessing people's health to the point to where they wouldn't necessarily have to cover them in the same way that they would cover a healthy person. I've got lots of opinions about that and unfortunately see it even play out in our healthcare system today too. Um, and really what I'm talking about is weight bias, weight stigma, and fat phobia. So this idea that looking at a larger body, at a fat body, um, there's something wrong with that. Um, there's something wrong with that body and then also attaching this health piece to it that if someone is in a larger body they're stigmatized assumed to not be healthy and like I mentioned in the 2016 study from UCLA those people in larger bodies they actually were healthy even though um, you know visually we wouldn't classify them as such. So these ideas, these weight, um, weight biased, fat phobic ideas have really been along, around for a very long time. In the 19, uh, 1910, I believe it was, yep, 1910, when World War I started, there was this uh, food rationing needed to happen. Lots of people were um, on the verge of starving in Europe and there was this big moral push to rational, ration, ration food in order to have enough food to go around. And when you're in a wartime and everybody wants to pitch in and, and help the population survive, you know, that's, that's one thing, we wanna help each other out. But what happened too, probably, you know, unintentionally, but just, this is just the way things uh, turned out, what happened is that this moralistic idea got attached to rationing food. So that if you were rationing your food, that meant you were doing, you were had a higher moral standing because you were going to be able to give more to the rest of the world's population. So when we had that moralistic value, kind of taking seed around food and around having smaller amounts of food, and coupled with this idea that, that fat bodies um, are not desirable um, and that they, they potentially are not, not healthy enough to be covered by life insurance or health insurance. Um, so we were really coming at it from all these different angles. The, the history shows us that we were coming at um, shaming different larger size bodies from a lot of different angles. And it then started to kind of snowball from there. So the BMI then was tied more consistently to assessing health. Doctors started to get on board going, well, I'll give, give my patients what they want. They want to talk about weight loss, so I guess I'll do that. And again, I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at people. This is just kind of how history played out. So the other fa fascinating part about history, and I remember when this happened, in 1998, Several world uh, health or the World Health Organization, as well as a, a number of other organizations, including the International Obesity Task Force, got together and they dropped the ranges on the BMI scale. So literally overnight, millions of people went from being normal-bodied into an overweight or even an obese category. So that's the reason that I put obesity in. When I say that, I put it in quotation marks because it's something that was really was created literally overnight by World Health Organizations and pharmaceutical companies in order to, to sell more weight loss drugs. So I've got so many problems with that um, and I'm so grateful to Christy Harrison for digging up all of those details because it just, blows my mind away what we will do um, for money. And it's kind of the seed to why the dieting industry is over $70 billion these days. So I want to offer you another way of looking at health. And hopefully by understanding some of that history, you can realize that we're talking about history, we're talking about economics, and nowhere in there were we really talking about people's health and it continues to be twisted as such. 
So I want to offer you another way of looking at health and looking at body sizes. And that is through the model of health at every size. And this model was created by Dr. Linda Bacon. And if you haven't picked up her book that she co-wrote with um, Lucy Aframore uh, entitled Body Respect, or even the little bit um, a meatier read, more heavy science read, um, the book Health at Every Size. Both are excellent reads if you're interested to learn more about the science um, behind Health at Every Size. And really what it means is when people can remove the focus of what their body size is, what the number on the scale is, we are more likely to have better mental health overall we're more likely to have more self-compassion. And both of those things promote other health behaviors. So for example, if you, um, let's see, if you, there's something you don't particularly like. Um, I'm thinking of a plant that, that we had um, for many, many years. It started to look a little sad. Um, myself or my dad would continue to prune it back and give it water and get it fertilizer like trying to make it go and at some point like it just it just no matter what we did it just wasn't um, it just wasn't looking well and we were getting kind of tired of fussing with it so we put it out in the yard waste into the compost and so we were getting kind of tired of it meaning we didn't really like it anymore we didn't like having to fuss with it and so we stopped we didn't. We didn't take care of it anymore. Now imagine if that's a body, and I know that's an extreme example from a plant to a human body, but if it, if it, you don't like your body, if you don't respect your body, you're, you're not as likely to take care of it. And when we get stuck in that critical self voice, um, mental shaming and blaming, which by the way we're taught from diet culture and the diet industry taught that it's your fault that your body looks a certain way or that you couldn't stay on a diet. Um, that, again, that's decreasing your mental health. And when you don't like something, including yourself, you're less likely to take care of it by getting the rest that you need, um, finding uh, clothes that fit well on your body, and that's a whole other story for people that are in larger bodies, and I totally respect that. Um, I am in an average size, um, thin, privileged body, and um, I can't begin to understand what people in larger bodies go through when they're trying to close shop and find clothes that fit well for them. Um, but my hope is that that industry, the more that we speak out about it, the more that we have these conversations, then clothing manufacturers will make that um, easier for all people in, in all body sizes. Um, eating a variety of foods. So this idea that if you believe in health at every size, then you eat whatever you want to with no regard for hunger, fullness, satisfaction, um, and you're gonna sit on the couch and eat Twinkies all day. Not that that's a bad thing, but in my experience and in the research, we don't see that that's true. People may do that for a while, especially if they're recently coming off of a rocky relationship with, with food and the ups and downs of the diet roller coaster. Yeah, you might want to sit on the couch and eat Twinkies for a while, but you're not going to want to do that forever. You will get to a point where you're like, you know what, it feels good to move my body. It feels good to have a salad every once in a while with a Twinkie on the side for balance. Um, the point being that health at every size comes from the, the viewpoint that as we reduce that weight stigma, the weight bias, and the fat phobia in our culture, then people are more likely to embrace the body that they have with respect, kindness, and compassion, and they will naturally work on behaviors that help them also have great metabolic health too barring any genetic, of course, genetic tendencies from a family. But if you are able to get adequate rest, um, move your body in ways that feel well for you, have access to a variety of foods, you are gonna be giving your body the best chance possible to have stable blood sugar, um, lower blood pressure through stress management, 
and improved cholesterol. So the high, whole idea of hating yourself healthy, it really doesn't work. It doesn't serve you. And I wanted to bring all of this up today because as I said, I wanted to apply these intuitive eating principles to the holidays. And you are going to start hearing, if you haven't noticed it already, this whole idea of like, oh, don't gain weight during the holidays. And you'll have to work off so much more when you get to January. Um, know that that's coming from diet culture, even if it's well-meaning, well-intended family members. But remember, there's a difference between intention and impact. And when you hear those statements, or you hear those advertisements, um, you even see them on uh, signs when you walk into the grocery store. Um, I even was on my bike ride the other day and I saw these um, advertising signs stuck in the lawn along the bike path advertising a turkey trot run. So that's pretty commonplace. I used to be a runner and, and people would do jingle bell runs or turkey trot runs around this time of year. What caught my attention, and to be honest, pissed me off, is not only did they say the distance of the run, that's fine, run, walk, whatever, and, and the distance of the course, they threw on a calorie amount onto the sign, making the assumption that if people got together and did this event, then they would be burning X number of calories. And they positioned it carefully on Thanksgiving Day with the assumption that people are going to eat more than they want to on that day and more than they should and so therefore they should get together and do this turkey trot run to burn off set amount of calories that is diet culture at its finest so even on a sneaky little yard sign alongside a bike path where most people are probably out there just enjoying moving their bodies and getting some fresh air you end up with diet culture smack in the face. So I wanted to talk today about that history and some of the science behind um, why dieting doesn't work and why you're even thinking about dieting. Again, that's the historical part. And I definitely wanna invite you to check out Christy's book, um, Anti-Diet by Christy Harrison. Also, other resources that could be really helpful are Health at Every Size and Body Respect by Lindo Bacon and Lucy Aframore. And of course, the wonderful Intuitive Eating, um, the new fourth edition is out in, in the, um, the text, the um, text reading text, and then also the workbook too can be really helpful. So as weather is changing, maybe you'll get a little bit of um, downtime around the holidays. It could be really helpful to check out those resources. And I have one additional resource that is a really quick, easy one. If you haven't downloaded it already, is the Savor Food and Body Guide that I created that's really uh, six simple steps to help you kind of identify diet culture and walk away from diet culture. And there's no time better than during the holidays to, um, to download that and start um, picking away at healing your relationship with food. So with that, I hope you all have uh, a great weekend, if it's your weekend, and um, I will catch you next week. Take care.